which apparently has some sort of agreement with the University of Southern California, uh, according to Tara McPherson. We're working on that, putting that in play. Um, I, yes, yeah, the USC thing. Um, I'm very, very honored, sort of, to be standing up here to talk about George. Uh, for the last three years, George and I have been collaborators on a series of projects related to accessibility um, and the digital humanities. And I can honestly say that across the board, he is a wonderful collaborator in a way that like, I wish I could take him and box him up to all of my faculty that we deal with to train them how to collaborate. Um, you know, his scholarship is very innovative in the field. There's, there's not a lot of people talking about accessibility who aren't just sort of talking about accessibility, but really are trying to, to put it in practice in the digital humanities in sort of very real ways. Um, and, and George is sort of leading the call, not just for digital humanists, but for humanists more generally, to sort of be attentive to issues of accessibility and to really think very clearly about where this sort of fits with their methodology and, and their practice. Um, and when I sort of decided that I was going to say something personal about George, um, it wasn't just about sort of his generosity as a colleague, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're in this field because we have a belief that we can change things about how the humanities can answer questions about how we can operate. And I can honestly say, if you're looking for someone to collaborate who has a, a passion for what he does, that George is the perfect person to talk to about new opportunities and new projects and the way accessibility and digital literacy can be built into the work that you're doing. So I'm honored to have him here and to introduce him. And if you come back tomorrow for our unconference, you can actually hear him talk with me about um, the project that to some extent I think is helping to inform some of the things he's going to talk about today with us. Um, you can tweet him online at George Online. Um, you can also tweet or hashtag the MythDD if there are issues or questions as they come up. Um, and then we also like to use the sort of accessibility, the common accessibility hashtag where possible. Um, so if you have questions or want to tweet, we encourage you to do that. Um, George Williams, everybody. Thank you everyone for coming and I, I do, there are a number of people in the audience that I've known for, in some, in some cases, close to 20 years and I don't want anyone who I've just met to feel like as a result there's this in crowd and, and then there are these other people because that's not the way that I'm, I'm feeling today at all and I'm happy to talk with any of you one on one after the talk in Q&A, via Twitter, on email, anything like that. So the talk that I'm giving today is titled Accessibility in digital environments, language, law, and the question of inclusion. This address, I have my own vanity URL shortener, GWMS, George Williams, GWMS.me slash, all caps, M-I-T-H-D-D, -D, and the number is 2013. That's a publicly viewable and editable Google Doc. I've never done this before, but there was a talk that I was going to give, and I'll give a brief summary of that, and then there's the talk that, I'm, that I am going to give. And I don't really have a full outline yet for that talk. I don't know. So, Linda Coleman, um, I, I'm, I'm doing what a lot of comedians do. I've started listening to podcasts in the last few years, and two of my favorites are uh, The Mental Illness Happy Hour, hosted by uh, Paul Gilmartin, and WTF, hosted by Mark Marin, And they talk sometimes in the interviews about the ways in which comedians go out to clubs and they're trying to work through their show in front of an audience to see what works and what doesn't work until they eventually get it right and maybe they record an hour-long special. And it just occurred to me literally like 10 minutes ago, that's kind of how I feel, literally like 10 minutes ago, that's kind of how I feel right now in that over the last week or so, I've really started thinking about this topic in a different direction than the paper that I will give at four C's this year, which is basically on the same topic, but in a different direction. So please, if you have time and inclination, in addition to or instead of live tweeting, feel free to tweet. I'm happy for you to do that. Go to the Google Doc and take notes. <laughs> it works for the most part. Um, it's something I started to do at, at, at meetings of that camp. Okay. So the talk that I was going to give was a live demonstration of breaking the law <laughs> in the following way. Let me pause for a second. There are handouts, and I'm gonna talk about those momentarily, although I realize I didn't actually save one for myself to talk from. There are handouts in a normal font size, and there are three copies in a large print. Thank you. All right, 
back to the main point. What I was going to do is talk about the ways in which there is a hitch in federal law into, about intellectual property. It is legal for you to take copyrighted material and transform it by turning it into an accessible format. So if you, have an, if you have the HTML, say, or other, some other kind of XML markup of a copyrighted text, the most recent John Grisham novel, you can put it into a Braille converter and then output a digital Braille file that can then be read with a refreshable Braille display or embossed on paper. And that's perfectly legal. And you can distribute as many copies of that accessible format as you want. All right? There's one problem. It is illegal to break the digital rights management lock on things like Kindle eBooks. So everything on this side of breaking the DRM is legal. You buy the book, you download it, you put it on your device, but it's digital rights management locked. If you were to break that law, on this side everything is legal. Turn it into Braille, turn it into a DAISY file, turn it into an audio file, I think. That's legal. There's some details of it I don't quite understand, but here's that one hitch. You can't break the DRM legally. Caliber is free ebook creation and transformation software that you can install a plugin that cracks DRM. It's trivial in terms of technical expertise required. And I've done it. And I was going to do it live in front of you and say, you know, take me away, feds. <laughs> And that's the moment, and then I was going to transform it. You picked the right day for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt said, I picked the right day for that, which is a good point, given the government shutdown we're currently experiencing. Um, but I, just, I changed my mind. I want to talk about, I want to talk about something else. The chronology of my presentation might seem kind of confusing. I want to start in the future, then I want to go back and then I want to come forward to the present again. Before I do that, I want to draw your attention to the handout that I gave you. I am um, the newest member of the Modern Language Association Committee on Disability Issues in the Profession. And one of the things that we are doing this year is revisiting and considering what updates are needed for the access guidelines for MLA conventions, session organizers, and presenters. Now, not everybody here is from one of the disciplines that isn't um, covered by the MLA. Not everybody here is, an, is a professor necessarily. How many of you have been to the Modern Language Association and been to sessions? How many of you have seen session organizers follow these guidelines? My guess is very, very few of you. We are supposed to, every one of us, we are supposed to bring multiple copies of any handout that we use and three large print copies. Not just the handouts, but the text of your presentation, even if it's just a draft. That hardly ever, if ever, happens. Um, mobility, I think, is probably something that most, if not all, but most rooms are probably okay with. In terms of hearing, I'm trying to speak at a slower and somewhat more loud, in a somewhat more loud manner than I usually do, but I'm trying to speak loudly enough for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, well, people who are deaf can't hear me, but people who are hard of hearing. I'm not moving around, which is what I usually do, because there's a camera on me, and I don't want somebody who's watching the video to not be able to see the added information of gestures or facial expressions, or if my face were lit better, reading my lips. Someone who is speaking is not supposed to be placed in a darkened place so that audience members who are deaf or hard of hearing can read their lips. You are supposed to use a microphone, even if you're one of those people who says, I don't need to use a microphone, everybody can hear me, right? No, use the microphone. Um, and I'm not saying, and this is something we should feel bad about, I'm just saying, these guidelines are here, we've worked these things out, so the problem isn't that we don't know what to do. The problem isn't that people with disabilities and organizations haven't yet come up with guidelines, the problem lies at the level of actually implementing the things that we all agree we should do and that aren't necessarily all that difficult to do. I've put that URL that used to be up there. I've put a great deal, and I will put more. I took this handout and I created it in a language called Markdown, which is a very simple 
markup language. And from Markdown, I exported it as HTML. I exported it as a Word file. And I think I exported it as, as one other thing. And if I if I'd had a little more time, I would have created a Braille file from it. So you create the document once, and then you transform it into all these other forms. It's online. You can download it, use it in whatever way is most useful to you. I'm trying to model what I think would be an ideal, accessible presentation, both in the physical space of face-to-face -face communication and in the digital environment of the online resources that one might share. Back to the slides. <coughs> so I want to start in the future and work our way backwards. And remember, I'm like the comedian in the club who's still working his act out, so I apologize for any hiccups. Feel free to ask, for quest ask questions or for clarification at the end. This is the project currently underway involving a variety of people. It's called Accessible Future. You can find it online at accessiblefuture.org and on Twitter as Accessible Food because that's the only number of, you know, you ran out of characters <laughs> at a certain point. Um, these workshops were Jen Giuliano's idea. The name Accessible Future was Corey Bohan's idea. These are two of my collaborators. People who are involved with this include uh, Jim Smith. Um, and I can remember people's Twitter handles a lot of times and can't remember their names. Kirsten Keister, Kirsten Keister who's a designer here at MIF. Lamppost? Creative, yeah. Creative Lamppost. Lamppost Creative on Twitter. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Boggs from Scholars Lab at University of Virginia will be helping with the workshop. Tina Hertzberg, who's my colleague in the School of Education at USC Upstate, will be helping with the workshop. Who am I forgetting? The center, so Northeastern, right. Emory. So this, the future is, it will be, say, spring semester of 2015, we will have completed our fourth workshop at our fourth institution. Um, and that will be, the fourth one will be at Emory University. Working back from that will be University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the fall of 2014. Spring of 2014 will be in Austin, Texas. And then later this semester will be Northeastern University in Boston. University of Texas in Austin, and then later this semester, Northeastern. The goal of these workshops is to bring people from a variety of audiences and teach them about how people with disabilities use digital information with an emphasis upon scholarly digital resources in the humanities. And two, to teach people, here's what you need to do to make your resources accessible to people with disabilities. The goal is to create or to point them to free, open source, user-friendly tools and everything that we create associated with these workshops, from the design of the websites to videos of presentations, to tutorials, all that stuff is going to be put online, available for free use um, with just attribution. Provided everybody gets on board, I don't want to take somebody's intellectual labor and license it in a way they don't want to, but it shouldn't be difficult for us to figure out how to make resources accessible to people with disabilities. This is the latest effort at getting towards that. And it's, it's important to note that it's collaborative, that not all of us knows how to do everything the other person does. There's some overlap, but there's a lot of individual, like I know that Jim can tell me if this idea that I have is possible or not. Like I found, here's this bit of code, and I know these other people took a bit of code like that, and they did this thing, what if we did this other thing? Does that work, Jim? And Jim takes a while to look at it and goes, yeah, that could work. I said, can you do that? Yeah. We write a grant, we get some money from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Office of Digital Humanities, which is how it's worked so far, and we work out a schedule. It's collaborative. It's not me. Like, I'm the guy who just can't shut up and who, like, is, it makes Twitter explode and who has ideas, but without everybody else being involved, it wouldn't work. And putting up with each other's both your strengths and your idiosyncrasies is an important part of the success of doing this. That's the future. We'll be done in 2015. We've got ideas. We've already started talking about what comes after that, but that's what that is. 
yesterday. So kind of, the, we're, we're sort of skipping, but yesterday, Abraham Nemeth passed away at the age of 94. How many of you, before, if you are not following me on Twitter or on Facebook, how many of you already knew who Abraham Nemeth was? Already. Only three people in the room. Abraham Nemeth was the creator of the Braille system for math and science. So Louis Braille is credited with the original Braille code in the early 19th century, but it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that somebody thought to create a code that would work for math and science. And that person was Abraham Nemeth. And as a result of taking somebody, he was teaching, uh, he was working with World War II vets on their calculus studies. And he went up to the blackboard to show them something. He's blind. And the professor is watching him write on a board and explain stuff. And he goes to him and says, would you be interested? I don't, I don't know all of the details. Would you be interested in teaching? He says, sure. And then he started to think about the way that he used Braille. It's his own idiosyncratic way of using Braille to do things like I was an engineering major for two and a half years, but that was a long time ago. So when you do something like 10 to the Second, what is that called? What is that? Say again? Exponentiation. Yeah, exponentiation. <laughs> he figured out, okay, how do we adapt what's called, what we now call literary braille to math and science? And it got more and more and more and more sophisticated. Here was somebody from within the field of math, a professor of math, who saw somebody from outside the field of math and said, hey, you're, we need your insights to meet the needs of some people. Now the World War II vets he was teaching were blind, but potentially he's this outsider who gets pulled into the community of math and science to help them reach this goal. That's present day, he just passed away. We often think about, I think we often think about Braille as, in its historical sense, Louis Braille, early 19th century, it was supposedly originally created for soldiers in the French army to communicate with each other at night because they didn't have to see, they could just feel it, and it would be a code so nobody else could crack it. And you think about it as this really interesting, but this guy was alive until yesterday, and he went a long way toward improving or at least extending what it's capable for Braille to do. Now, accessibility. The hashtag that Jim referred to, it looks like ally, which is a happy sort of typographical visual pun. But it's actually the letter A and then one one, it's on the whiteboard. The letter A and then one one and the letter Y. And it was created for Twitter because Twitter is how many characters? 140 characters. How many letters are in the word accessibility? 13. Add a hashtag, 14. That's a contraction. A, 11 characters, one, one. Oh. Why? That stands for accessibility. How many of you already knew that? Right? So that's like three people in the audience. And so when we talk about access, we talk, this is, there's probably more to it than this, but there are three possible meanings. You say, oh, that was really accessible. What you might mean is that was understandable. I get that. You know, I read this essay by so and so, and I didn't. Really, you know, I, I've tried to understand Judith Butler. I just don't find her writing accessible. We also think about it in terms of open access, the open access movement, putting digital, often in our community, thinking about scholarly materials online, not behind a paywall, open access. Uh, we talk about access when we talk about the needs of people with disabilities. But there's also access in terms of power or belonging or being on the inside. You know, do you have access to the White House? Um, Abraham Nemeth, you know, having access to the community of math and science scholars. And these are things that I want us to think about today. These are things that I'm trying to work through today. Going back to the past, hard to believe that it was almost 20 years ago that I came to the University of Maryland as a first year PhD student. Fall of 1993, I moved here from Atlanta, Georgia. I rented a duplex 5507 43rd Street in Hyattsville, Maryland, just down the street from DeMatha High School, apparently very famous for football, high school football. I don't know, I don't follow that stuff. 
and it was just over there, like 200 feet from us, the first time I ever went on the World Wide Web. Non-print media services had a bunch of computers. I was married at the time, and we were like, hey, look at this, this is kind of cool. That year was also the first year, and this is not something I've talked about before, but that was also, back in time, that was also the, f the first time I was diagnosed with a mental, well, the only time I was diagnosed with a mental illness. And I don't identify as a person with a disability. I choose not to identify. I don't identify, it's not part of my scholarly identity. I've talked about it before. I talked about it at four C's several years ago. But not in terms of this is a disability. If I did identify as a person with a disability, one of the things that I might do is, because of the law, Americans with Disabilities Act, 1990, I could ask for accommodations. As an employee, I'm a professor. I need more time to get to tenure. Um, sometimes I'm gonna miss class because I can't make it that day. I've never done that. And the reasons are multiple. Stay with me, I know there are lots of threads going on here, but in my head they make sense. And yes, I know, I just said mental illness, so it's okay to laugh at that. Uh, in my head they make sense. Um, one reason not to ask for accommodations, it's never occurred to me. I never, like it was really only when I started thinking about this talk and what I might address that I thought, why didn't I ever do that? The other is, how many of you know what the policy at the University of Maryland is for accommodating the needs of faculty with disabilities? We all know, hopefully, the needs of students, disability support services, usually do a pretty good job of advocating and making clear for students. They first have to self-identify, and there's a whole lot of stuff involved with whether or not a student can and knows to and feel okay with self-identifying and revealing that to other people. But accommodating the needs of faculty with disabilities? Are there any guidelines? Is there some sort of national? Does, well, the AAUP has guidelines, has whole set of things about that. But it, I would have no idea, as a, as a junior faculty member where I am now, I'm tenured now, but when I was untenured, and then when I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City before that, I would, have, I would not feel confident asking that question. And I think most people with invisible disabilities, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I would not be surprised if most people with invisible disabilities wouldn't feel the same way because this is a profession in which your brain, your mind, is the most valuable thing. Well, if you can't do the work, then maybe this isn't the kind of job for you. And number three, I was going to get a picture of my chair rolling his eyes, because the third thing was, even if I were to say, these are the accommodations that I need, how are my colleagues going to view that? Oh, well, he's the guy who gets to have more time because he's got a disability. Um, and then finally, there's me rolling my eyes. Because I don't always feel like I have a disability. I don't always feel like I have a mental illness. It's, it's something that is not with me all the time. It's with me in times of very high stress, like the last two weeks or so. Um, <laughs> and it makes it difficult to do the work of being a professor. But it doesn't make it impossible 24-7, 365. So there's also um, last week, uh, two weeks ago at the Committee on Disability Issues in the Profession. We were coming up with panel topics, possible panel topics for MLA 2015. And one was um, disabilities and conversion narratives, right? Like you live your whole life thinking of yourself as one thing or being one thing, and then either something happens or you make a change in your, you know, realizing something about yourself. And there's this, like I wasn't a person with a disability and now I am. And the idea of you go in and out of that state, maybe, and Matt asked me earlier today, you know, has anybody ever challenged me as who are you as an able-bodied person to be making these decisions about how we create resources for people with disabilities? It was actually whether anyone had ever challenged you on that point. Is that not what I said? <laughs> you suggested that I challenged you. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt has pointed out <laughs> my mistake. Matt said, has anybody ever asked me that question? Who are you as an able-bodied person to make these decisions? And I said, no, nobody's ever asked me that question. I've often thought about it, but people with disabilities 
are both an alliance, or many of them think of themselves as a kind of alliance, but they're also very, like, a deaf person and a person who is blind are as different from each other, perhaps, as a sighted person is, and a sighted hearing person is, from either one of them. Which is not to say that there is no such thing as creating an alliance, but the other answer, which I wasn't ready to give yet, because I didn't want to give away the surprise, was, yeah, I am a kind of a person with a disability, and it's a discursively constructed identity. And I'm fortunate that it's a mental illness that I get to control whether or not, right? I haven't been institutionalized against my will. I haven't been institutionalized at all. Um, but it's definitely something that is culturally constructed. And that two generations ago, four generations ago, my experience of life would be very different. If I were not a white male, my experience would be very different. This is not something that by itself inflects my experience of the world. And so it's that kind of empathy or understanding that I try to bring to thinking about when you create resources, what input do you seek from people who are not like you about whether or not the resources you're creating are being created in the best way? For, to suit their needs? And are they involved in user testing? Are they members of your team who are helping create stuff? These are questions that I think every digital humanities project should keep in mind. Let's see where I was going next. Okay, so access is understanding. We think about academic discourse as being necessarily difficult, necessarily challenging. And if you don't understand it, maybe you don't belong here. And if I understand it and you don't, then I feel good about myself. And I'm not going to try to like spin my talk today overturning everything we know about academia. But if we want to acknowledge the needs of people with mental disabilities, should we rethink the way that we communicate with each other in intellectual terms, in terms of vocabulary, in terms of syntax, um, or in affective terms, in terms of whether or not you're upsetting someone with the way that you're asking your question at the panel at MLA when they were a grad student and you, and this didn't happen to me, and you raise your hand and say, this isn't a question so much as a comment. I think the problem with what you're saying is, and then the grad student at the front of the room feels this like lead ball in the pit of their stomach. Like, you're not understanding that person's experience. You're not, and I'm not saying be patronizing to them, but lots of graduate students deal a lot with anxiety, even when there's no, you might think there's no need for them to do so. And I say this as somebody who spent time in grad school here sleeping on the floor of my basement at night because it was like this was the quietest place that I can actually sleep. So access is understanding, like you're presenting material in a way that your audience, everybody in your audience, can get it. <coughs> and the way to make sure that you're doing that is not to imagine for yourself what they need, but to seek their input. So I walked, uh, the folks here at MIF putting me up at the University Inn and Conference Center, it's a wonderful place, um, and I walked over there, found out this morning, there's a shuttle, uh, so I would've been a lot less sweaty if I'd known that, but, um, <laughs> I still think like an undergrad, and like a graduate student and stuff. I'll just walk over there. Um, and I walk up to the back, and they're doing renovations. And I walk up to where I'm pretty sure I've gone in before, but I can't quite remember. Remember, you know, some kind of stuff going on in my brain sometimes. I can't, what, I've been here before. I'm supposed to go in here, these doors are locked. There's a sign with an arrow that points to the right. And it says, use the such and such circle entrance for the front entrance. I don't know what that means, because I don't know where the such and such circle is. I don't know where the front is. They're trying to give me access to the building. They know where the front of the building is. They know where that circle is. And they think that that information plus an arrow is enough. If you're the first time, if that's your first time going there, that's not enough. And there are ways in which both the way we write our scholarship, the way we build the navigational elements of our digital projects make sense to us because we built it, or because we've painfully, painstakingly figured out, oh yeah, that's what this is, you know? 
there's a point at which you can, there's a point you can reach where you say, yeah, I know James Butler says stuff that's really important and influential. I just, that's not my thing. You know, I'm not going to dismiss her ideas. I'm not going to dismiss Zizek. I'm not going to say that people who find that stuff important and influential are wrong. I don't have to. I'm not, I don't need to. But no, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to spend all weekend trying to understand a 20-page essay by it. Because I can't. I'm not going to understand it. And I'm not saying that to insult them, but that's not accessible to me. And I feel okay with that. But when you're somebody who's a grad student or an undergrad and you're still trying to prove yourself, you don't have that privilege yet. If they would write in a way that took more seriously the needs of people who don't already know where such and such circle is and where the front is, or if they would at least provide references that, that pointed you to those places that were easy to understand, it would make it a lot easier in both intellectual and affective terms. Access is open access. Here's where digital humanities, in my opinion, and humanities computing, what it was called before then, have been great. So much of what we create. In fact, the, the default, it's assumed that you put it up online, it's not behind a paywall for the most part. You know, you don't have to pay money to, you don't have to subscribe to Romantic Circles. You don't have to subscribe to the Blake Archive. It's, it's open, right? And there are a lot of new journals coming along that are open, they're born digital, open access. Are there any terms, let me pause for a second, break the convention of me talking to you. Are there any terms I've used so far that are unclear? Am I using affective in a way that makes sense to you? Because it's entirely possible I'm using it wrong. Sort of emotional, which is often a very, for me, a very physical kind of experience of something that bypasses what might be going on up here. But as Jeremy Boggs said to me in an instant message, when we were instant messaging back and forth a few years ago, you know, we say that it's really important to provide access, but access has to be more than just you throw a bunch of stuff up online and let anybody access it. Because people with disabilities, they have different devices often than we do. They access information differently than we do. They process information cognitively differently than we do. We know, and I, I'm not capable, well, I'm probably capable, I'm not qualified to assess the science on this, but we know from magnetic resonance imaging that people's brains figure out how to use the part of the brain that they don't use because they don't have sight or they don't have hearing. Blind people's brains get rewired, wire being figurative. Um, they process a lot of meaning in what we use to process vision. So how I access, how I know how to listen to things is very different than how a blind person knows how to listen to things. The, and I'm not trying to repeat the sort of, you know, the superhero daredevil who's a Marvel comic superhero who is injured in an accident and exposed to radiation, all of his other senses get heightened because of that. That's not the argument that I'm making. Um, and there's, there are ways in which that's kind of offensive. But when I listen to, and I write about this in the chapter that I wrote for um, Debates in Digital Humanities, when I listen to a blind person using a screen reader, a screen reader is software that they use to read the text in front of them, I can't understand it at all because it's going, you know what I'm talking about, it's going about five times, sometimes more, faster. Mm -hmm. And what I say, what I point out in my article is, in that scenario, I can't understand, and they can, which one of us is the person with the disability. It's about how the information is presented that actually makes this kind of discursively constructed, this person is disabled, this person is not. So we don't do a great job of making the digital resources that we have created accessible to people with disabilities. If we did, it would be better for all of us. How many of you have ever gone to the Blake Archive? Never. That's <laughs> half the people in the room. Fantastic, groundbreaking, um, precedent-setting edition of ongoing edition of an archive of the works of William Blake. 
But the interface, here's what's heartbreaking about the Blake Archive. It's got all the metadata that would make it an incredible resource for blind people because it describes in text different parts of all of these Blake prints. But it, when you get that text, it's presented in an inaccessible format. It won't work with screen readers. If it's not the interface, it's not the part that you're looking at that's working. Like the stuff in the back is all fantastic. If they could just rework what's getting at you, it would be amazing in terms of accessibility. All that metadata is there. And this is why I think the digital humanities is uniquely positioned along with information science to really tackle this. Accessibility for people with disabilities, and it's a big part of it is structured documents and metadata that I can't see the image, but if you can describe the image, I can understand it. Um, I can't see the headings and subheadings, but I have software that speaks to me and I can tell it, just read to me all the heading level ones, and it will jump on those and I'll say, okay, stop there, I wanna hear that section. Read to me all the heading level two, stop there, now the heading level, like I can, if I'm a, a depth screen reader user, I can use your structured documents to navigate your content. And we're great at that in the digital humanities. Like we're obsessive about that. Um, but we don't quite get it right. So access means open access, but there's more to it than that. You know, this is, sorry, I should have advanced the slide. Access as accessibility. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're getting there. I'm amazed at, you know, we had some meetings this morning about rolling some of the stuff that we've, and I, I use we loosely, because I feel mostly like I'm just kind of hanging around while all these other people are doing stuff, and I put in suggestions, but that's just, you know, that's just, it's collaboration is not something that we're used to thinking about. And I know people say this, I've been saying this for years and years and years. Ideally, a collaborative process is one in which everybody feels like they're making a contribution. And I'm still getting used to the idea of, I had this idea, and I asked a bunch of people if it would work, and they said yes, and I asked them if they would want to do it, and they said yes. Am I part of the team? I, you know, Nick yes. Fury, okay, thank you. <laughs> so Jen says yes, thank you. I don't like this metaphor, but I often think of it. How many of you have seen the movie or read the comic books, The Avengers? They've all got superpowers, for the most part. Nick Fury, the guy who brings them all together, he doesn't have superpowers. He's cute. He's cute and he's badass. There you go. I like to, yeah, I mean, I like to think of myself like I'm the Nick Fury. I know a bunch of people with superpowers and I know stuff that needs to get done and I can help them figure out or conceive of projects. But then there's a certain point at which like I can't do that other stuff. And that's awesome to me. I don't think I could have had the career that I've had if, if that weren't the case. And part of that is because of the way that my brain works. Um, access as power or belonging. I've spent a lot of time thinking I don't belong here. Um, when I came to Maryland, I was married and my wife at the time had an assistantship and I didn't. We had two cars, we sold one, I used that to pay for my tuition. And she got, to, and I'm not complaining, I'm saying this is how I reacted to stuff. She was meeting her fellow grad students, she had, you know, there was this sort of, like Beyonce says, and I've used this joke before, if you like it, then you're gonna put a ring on it. Like if you really value, usually that gets a laugh, if you really value, <laughs> thank you. Like money is the thing that, that really, yeah, and there's a whole, I understand, you know, problematic with using that metaphor. But if you go to grad's program and they say, yeah, we really want you here. Can I have an assistantship? Well, maybe next year. And, and I over, probably overreacted in terms of, I need to prove myself, I need to prove myself, I need to prove myself. Getting the assistantship eventually the following year didn't help, didn't make me feel like I won. Um, getting a fellowship, having a whole year to work on my dissertation that was competitively awarded, that didn't help. Successfully completing my Dissertation didn't help. Landing a tenure track job didn't help. Um, getting tenure, which I've done now, it, it's helped a little bit, but it hasn't helped <laughs> as much as I thought. Um, but the things that have been helpful to me, the things that have made me feel like I belong, 
have mostly been the kinds of things that people have said to me over the years. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things, you know, sort of moving forward. Remember the chronology, start in the future, present, go back, work our way forward. When I was on the job market, there are lots of things that I could quote. Um, when I was on the job market and I, I had a interview somewhere, campus interview somewhere, interviewed an MLA, flew to the campus, I was one of three finalists, and I didn't get the job. And I remember Matt saying this, he said, well, it's their loss. And it really surprised me. Not because I thought, you know, Matt's usually a jerk. It was just like, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Like, I've got something valuable. They're not gonna get it. That really stuck with me. That helped me feel like I belong here. By here, I mean like in academia. It's just kindness from people. And pretty much everyone in this room that knows me, that I've you know, known for 20 or 10 or two years, a big part of feeling like belonging has been kindness and empathy and encouragement and respect for difference. You know, one of the things that has happened, I'm at, I'm at 36 minutes, so I've got... 10. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm watching my time. I miss deadlines. Uh, once you publish some stuff, and there's a Venn diagram that's out there, and on one circle is disability studies in the humanities, and the other circle is digital humanities, and at the intersection of those two circles is you, <laughs> people invite you to give talks. And I feel like that's a lot. I'm stressed. I'm not, like, I'm, I'm just pointing out what seems obvious to me. And I've canceled at the last minute on invited talks. I've missed, I've you know, been invited to be on panels with people and just freaked out the day that the stuff was due. Um, and people have been okay with it. Nobody, I didn't get fired. Um, and that's a, that, that is, I'm not sure that people weren't, I, mean, I know that people have been angry at me. And that's happened more than once. It's happened more than twice. It's happened more than three times. And I don't just mean, I mean like over my academic career. And there's a kind of kindness and generosity and respect for difference. Okay, that's how you are. You're still valuable. And I know that. I don't have to worry that when I do that, they're going to think, yeah, you know how white guys are. Like, there's not going to be the kind of stereotyping that would happen if I belonged to another category of identity. If I were a woman, if I were a person of color, if I self-identified as a person with a disability, that kind of thing might happen. So I understand that my experience of these things has been inflected by both the elements of my identity that, that to which, I'm going to get the prepositions wrong, the elements of my identity that make me privileged versus the elements of my identity that make me more marginalized or disempowered. And so what I want to turn to is thinking about the people who say, I don't feel welcome in the digital humanities. I'm t I'm, or people who might say, if they're a grad student at the University of Maryland, I'm not sure if I belong, you know, if what I do is considered the digital humanities. Or, I went to that camp and everybody treated me like I didn't belong there. When people first started tweeting stuff like that, I just thought, what are they talking about? But enough people started to talk about those things that I said, hey, there's something here. This is three recommendations that I'm going to get to. Um, they're mostly, and this is just from my experience, this is not some sort of statistical analysis I've done, younger scholars, they're mostly women, and they're mostly people of color. And many of them, not all of them, don't feel like they belong. And it's not because necessarily, like they're, what I'm trying to get at is this idea of sort of empathy, respect for difference, inviting people into projects mm -hmm. in ways that like, say, Abraham Nemeth, who wasn't even trying to like, I want to do this, but somebody said, hey, we need that kind of insight over here. Um, we don't all have the same strengths from all the same people. There's difference. And I really want the digital humanities as a community to think seriously about what it is that people are saying and why they're saying it when they say they don't belong here. They don't feel like they belong here. And 
I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I have three, you know, think about, think about the affective experience that they might be having. If you're the only woman of color in an audience about the digital humanities, and the speaker is defining the digital humanities in a way that excludes the kind of work that you do that you thought was digital humanities, how does that feel? What I don't want to say is whether or not that makes sense. Because remember, mental, like, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best judge of that. And I'm not saying that jokingly. Um, but how do you think that person feels? And how does it make you feel to know that person feels that way? That's, that's not an intellectual argument. It's not necessarily an academic argument. But it's, it's, it, it's how I think about these issues. Three suggestions. I don't know what these would look like. Just kind of came up with them. I don't mean like on the fly. I mean like over the last, <laughs> over the last few months. Do you guys know what the Bechtel test is? Mm -hmm. So Alison Bechtel is this cartoonist. Uh, she wrote for a long time, wrote a strip called Dykes to Watch Out For. Most recently, she's gained acclaim for her two memoirs, one about her father and one about her mother. In 1985, she wrote a strip in which one of her characters said, I think this is right. This is a long time ago now. I only go see movies where there are two female characters who talk to each other about something other than men. And when you apply the Bechdel test to most movies, they fail. <laughs> now, it's, it's, a, it's a rubric, basically. It's a very simple rubric. And it's not a substitute for film criticism. It's not anything that a director would use to make a movie. But it does make visible certain things that otherwise might be invisible to us. So here's what I'm sort of tongue one quarter in cheek proposing. We need a Bechdel test for digital humanities projects. I don't know what it would look like. It wouldn't be there must be two women in the archive. There, you know, there must be, there must be letters. To, it's not going to be that. But we need a simple, kind of funny, easy to understand rubric that's not hurtful, but that makes visible certain things that otherwise we don't notice. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need, I think, is, and this is really something that I, I don't know that I'm capable of thinking all the way through. Universal design is a different principle than accessible design. Mm -hmm. Accessible design means, oh, we got somebody with a disability, we need to, all right, well, here are the stairs, but we're going to put a ramp over here for people with, with, with disabilities, people who use a wheelchair. That's creating an accessible entrance to a building. Universal design is creating, and this applies to all kinds of things, you're creating something so that it's usable by everybody. People who, are, who have a disability, people who don't have a disability. It's aesthetically pleasing, and it's not more expensive, but you're not singling out people saying, oh, you need this, here you go. So there's universal design for the built environment, which is an architectural term that I talk about in the article that I wrote. Um, I argue for universal design in digital humanities environments or in digital environments that it improves the environment for everyone. But we need something like universal design for discursive environments. Anybody can enter. And it's not going to feel dumbed down. And it's not going to feel chopped off. But it's going to be usable and accessible in the sense of understanding and, and belonging by the widest number of people. Univer I think it's pretty smart. I don't know what it's going to look like. Universal design for discursive environments. And then finally, um, I've got like 50 seconds. So Lisa Rohde wrote uh, an essay that I think is great, where she takes Tina Fey's memoir, Bossy Pants, the section where Tina Fey talks about improvisational comedy, mm -hmm. and the underlying rule of improvisational comedy is yes and. That if, if, you, if, we're, if we're doing improvisational comedy and you point a gun at me, what I don't say is, well, that's not a gun, that's just your hand. That's not yet. Yes, and is to say, to do this, that's the yes. And the and part is, I think this is the example, you're going you're gonna to point the gun I gave you for Christmas at me? You bastard. That's the and. You add more to it. <clears throat> Where we have these differences, everybody, whether it's people who are members, who are individuals who feel excluded or are members of these kind of counter DH organizations or organizations that are pushing against, let's all, what would that look like? What would a yes and approach to this be? Instead of the traditional as um, 
Graf and Birkenstein in They Say, I Say argue, you know, academic discourse is inherently agonistic, right? And agonistic and agony have the same etymological roots. I don't like agonistic, even performative ones, environments. So what if, what would that look like? I don't know. But I bought the domain name yesand.me. It's yes dash and dot me. Ten bucks. I have hosting stuff. We could build something if we wanted to. It wouldn't be affiliated with any existing organization, but it could be. Those of you who've been around long enough might remember the point at which nines was first created, that there were all these 19th century literature sites that weren't really interoperable. And so the idea was, let's create something called nines that would try to pull all of these under the same rubric and make them interoperable in some way. They're still going to be distinct. I don't know that that's what this would be, but like, I just bought the domain name. I don't want to be in charge of it. Like, this is, I'm Nick Fury. I'm putting out a call for other people with special powers to imagine what that might look like. I'll help build it, but Bechdel Tests for Digital Humanities Projects, Universal Design for Discursive Environments, yes and. I don't know what any of this exactly would look like, but those are just ideas, and that's basically what I do. I think that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>
In terms of the ethical part, I don't know. To be honest, everybody says they're concerned about the needs of people with disabilities. Who wouldn't? And yet, there's that, um, I always forget, remember, I can't remember the names, but Jay Smooth, the, the YouTube guy mm -hmm. who does, he has this video on how to tell somebody they sound racist. And he says, don't focus on what they are. Focus on what they did or said. Because once you start saying to somebody, well, I think you're a racist, then all of a sudden they start coming up with all these reasons why they're not racist. So focus on what they said. Now, here's what you said. And so ethics, I think ethics gets at that part of the equation that we don't really want to have that conversation because there's no way to win it to the extent that it's something to win. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I look at your website and you say that you're concerned about the needs of people with disabilities. I'm not concerned with what you say you believe in. I want your website to be accessible to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. ADA was 25 almost years ago. You know, there's all kinds of stuff about how to, how to make it accessible to people with disabilities. <clears throat> so I don't know how to get at the ethical question. In terms of what are the things that we should be doing? Visual materials for somebody who is blind or low vision, um, Do a demo, if that's okay. Are there any notes? Do we get notes? No. No need to notes? Okay. You got tweets. Okay, cool. Um, so this is the development version of, is this okay? Yeah, that's okay. Right. So Kirsten has been working on, and it's not there yet. We're, st we're still working on it. But let me just give you an example. So here is the Braille SC site in progress. Um, Notice how big these are? Somebody who is, say again? I said they're glorious. <laughs> Somebody who's low vision, there's a, you know, it's, we tried to have what Tina Hertzberg and I sort of came up with as a list of things that we would like to see Kirsten in, enable is make it really clean. You know, like don't have a whole lot of foo-foo uh, stuff going on. So there's a lot of white. There's big headlines, so if I'm if I'm low vision, I can do that. Uh, if I'm colorblind, I can get rid of or you know if, if even that background. I mean, if you notice mm -hmm. the background, I'll go back to standard. The background going away, mm -hmm. or maybe I need this, mm -hmm. or maybe I need this. Um, you know, there are there are these little widget plugins that you can add to think about people who have various kinds of. They're not blind. They might be legally blind. Mm -hmm. But there are things that you can do there. It's um, sans serif too. The font is that deliberate? Yes. Um, the, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, my off-the-cuff answer is I'm pretty sure that sans serif font is more readable mm -hmm. on a screen, certainly for people with, you know, mm -hmm. um, who are blind to low vision. And when I say blind, you can be blind and still see. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you can increase the font. Now, people often say, "Well, can't I do that in the?" So increase the font does this. Blow it up. Blow up the font. Blow up the font. Mm -hmm. Notice what's not getting blown up, the images. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, we'll go back to standard, mm -hmm. default. If I do, this, this is what people always say, and they have a point. Don't you have that in your, in your browser? Sure, but when I do that, yeah. it's, it's more complicated. The layout gets screwed up. Um, this is also a responsive design, meaning, I should just look at it here. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at it on your computer, it looks like this. But if you looked at it on your um, iPad, it would look like that. See that stuff that disappears? Because all that stuff in the upper right, it turns into a couple of drop-down menus. Mm -hmm. oh. This is responsive design. It's, um, the guy who came up with this concept is Ethan Marcotte, and his, uh, his beep on Twitter. Um, and he writes for a list of party. He wrote a book on... Uh, responsive design. And then as you get smaller and smaller, if this were your phone, you notice how that image gets smaller. We want to make those things. Um, so those are some things there. The other thing is if you have an image, we want to include something, and we, I don't think we've got this here, which because we're still working on this, but there should be what's called alt. 
text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in HTML, there's a particular way to do it, um, where it's a visual description of what that is. There are ways of, if you are using a screen reader, this is a long answer to your question, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, and I'll be happy to talk about it more tomorrow at the Uncom. <laughs> if you are using a screen reader, what people who use screen readers often do is jump across all the links. They jump across all the links. And often on WordPress, you have the title, you have an excerpt, and then it'll say read more. So they'll, re they'll be jumping, read more, read more, read more, read more. They have no idea what's on the other side. And there's a way to tweak that code so that it tells you if you want, you know, somewhere. if you want to read more about this topic, then go here. There's a WordPress accessibility plugin that's wonky, as I understand it, but that seeks to, in WordPress sites, automatically implement this stuff. And as Jim has been arguing for, we need to make more of these kinds of things part of the core code of these content management systems and not these plugins that you can add if you want to. They just should be part of what we do. And so I think that the CMSs, like Omeka, you know, the CMSs that digital humanities people are building should have, should, they should from the ground up be thinking about these issues and thinking about the ways in which they make these sites more usable for everybody, not just people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. If you, and then I'll stop, if you go to accessiblefuture.org and you click on readings, this is a whole lot of stuff that might help you understand mm -hmm. how this stuff might work. These recommended texts, and then this stuff, um, I'm gonna work on getting this stuff a little better organized, but accessiblefuture.org slash readings, there's a whole lot there about these are things that we need to do. And the essay that I wrote that's in digital, sorry, that's in Debates in Digital Humanities, um, I make three, I think, these are three good projects that people could take on. I think one of them is the Braille translation software that we've already created, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, so hopefully that's, a, that's an answer to your question. What do you think? Thoughts? Well, all text is often very minimal. Description in the humanities is long. Yep. Where's the, how do we bridge that or address that tension? So, alt text, and I'm repeating the question again. This is another question from Jen Saventi. Alt text in most web pages is minimal. This is a picture of a dog. In the humanities, we would want it to be as rich as possible. This is a picture of a dog sitting on a blue couch. You know, the dog appears to be some sort of Labrador mix possibly older, wearing a pink collar with silver studs, in the background is a wood paneled wall, like stuff like that. I don't know the answer to that question, but that's the kind of question that every single one of us should think, not just, oh, I better think about the needs of people with disabilities, but also, what a fascinating question. Because it is. That's my answer. I was just thinking that in terms of accessibility, the people, a category of people who love the ADA and what it has done for us. The Americans with Disabilities Act. The American with Disabilities Act. And they don't necessarily realize that this is what they should be grateful to are parents with small children in strollers. Mm -hmm. They were not intended to be addressed by the ADA, but it has made our lives so much easier. You can go everywhere with your kid. You never have to take them out of the comfy stroller. Because? Because it's accessible to everyone. It's not accessible, it's universal. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. But I'm wondering, I'm, I'm struck by a lot of what you're describing as being good practices for everyone, and that maybe part of the ethics is to appeal to people's really selfish interests in yeah. this looks beautiful, and it happens to be universal. Yeah. I think that that's, I think that's part of the answer. You know? So here's an example of what, so the, so the yeah. Comment or question from the audience member Sarah Warner is right. Because mm -hmm. I, I know your Twitter name, and I'm always kind of unclear about what. <laughs> Wait, is he really? Is that? Um, one category of people who are very thankful for the ADA are parents of small children, because it's easy to take kids in strollers anywhere. The reason is because of the way that the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to people who who, who create built environments requiring them to keep the needs of people in wheelchairs in mind. Curb cuts, there's an example of a curb cut where instead of a regular curb, you've got, sorry, I'm trying to do the 
This is the so this is the Jeremy Boggs move where you zero in on a particular part. Instead of just a curve where you have to like you know lift up the back and then it's a cut, and then you can just roll it in, and that's useful for everybody. I'm a cyclist. If I'm if I'm riding my bike, I'm not supposed to be on the sidewalk because I'm maybe going faster than nine miles an hour. It's illegal. But if I'm if I'm slowing down and I or if I'm walking my bike, that makes it really easy. I have a nice vintage Bianchi road bike. I don't want to dent the wheels. Um, if I am in a city and I'm pulling my groceries home, that makes it easy. If I'm an older person and I can't, you know, my mobility is or I'm using a walker, that makes it easy. It's stuff like that, that's universal design, that you build, you create a built environment that's usable for everyone. The other thing that we're often seeing now is te uh, texture strips. So that if I'm using a white cane and it's going zzz, and it, you know, I'm, that's the sound of like the, the thing at the bottom of the cane scraping across the concrete and when it hits the texture, I can feel that it's different. I'm close to, if you ride the metro, I'm close to the edge here. It's also useful for us we're on our phone and suddenly it feels different, right? I know I need to stop. That's universal design. This works for everyone. Doorknobs are now different than they used to be. They used to be this. If you have arthritis, if you don't have a hand, if you have a bunch of stuff that if you're carrying in a bunch of boxes of lunch, you can still open that door. You don't have to have a disability for that to be useful to you. Um, the way that, now you, okay, you set me off. <laughs> the way that I wanted to have a picture of, an, of a universal design of this. This is the, thank you for coming, this is the <laughs> water fountain right across the way. You better have a finger and you better have pretty good strength to get water out of that because it's a little button that's about an, an inch across. I have a picture somewhere in my Flickr archive of 7,000 photos of the water fountain on the wall in the building where I teach at USC Upstate and it's a bar. So that you can, if you, if you, this is what is often my situation. I'm off to class. I got my books here. I have my um, Contigo plastic water container here, and I put my hip up against that bar and I fill it up. I'm not a person with a physical disability who needs that, but it works for all of us. So, what does that look like in a digital environment? Is the question that we all need to be asking, and we're benefiting from. Here's the website, ada.gov, details about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Section 508.gov is specific to digital environments, also a federally hosted and maintained site. Um, we all benefit from this stuff. The overlap, the Venn diagram of, the Venn, are you making jokes about me in the back, Jason? We're talking about the shutdown notice. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, and this is important to remember, like sure, it's inconvenient if you go to DC and you can't get into a museum. Or you're an employee, like I assume there are some in the library somewhere, and you're, you're not getting paid, and you're not going to work. But there are people, like this is really affecting some of the most, and I don't need to tell you guys this, but it's affecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society when this kind of stuff happens. Um, I had a point, I lost it, but, oh, if there's a Venn diagram, Again, this is, these are the standards for accessibility. And there's another circle. These are the standards for mobile design. They overlap significantly. So a lot of us spend a significant amount of time accessing information on our phones. If you work on making your resources accessible to people with disabilities, you're most of the way towards making them accessible to people who use mobile devices. Who's using mostly mobile devices? Our students, my students certainly, a lot of them have phones, very few of them have their own laptops, comparatively speaking. Um, and there's data, there's demographic data, the Pew, I forget the whole name of the organization, the Pew Internet Research, American Life. There's data about people from um, Latino, Latina communities here in America and people from African American communities who don't necessarily have high speed internet at home, they don't necessarily own their own computer. Their primary mode of accessing digital information is their mobile device. You're making stuff accessible to people with disabilities. You're also making it accessible to all of these people. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize there'd be a soapbox back here. <laughs> <laughs> We're just about at the end of our time. So if we've got one more question. Sure, I just uh, kind of building on both the last two questions. So you talked earlier about how structured data is something that digital humanists are, are particularly good at working. Right? That we, 
that we uh, work on and we have expertise here. But we also know a lot about the limits of structured data, especially in working with things like TEI and whatnot. And I'm thinking, for example, of Laura Mandel's project where she's having, you know, she, she creates multiple readings of, of one text, right, in order to sort of expose the nuance of the argument in each text, right? So that's, that's sort of the limits of structured data running into sort of a strategy for accounting for that. And I'm wondering if there are other strategies that you know of or can think of where that, that might, you know, building on Sarah's point of like sort of like let's get to sort of our own innate basic selfishness and, and approaching questions that interest us, you know, globe, you know, each, each individual's research agenda. So are there strategies that exist in, in this question, this core DH question of managing structured and unstructured data and nuance and humanities materials that we can use then in basic principles of universal design. Does that make sense? I think so. That we're running, so in other words, so it's a um, question from Jason Rohde, private citizen in the audience about if curb cuts and doorknobs and these other things are examples of universal design that benefit a much larger audience than just people with disabilities. And building on the point I made before about how structured information, structured documents are really nicely navigable for people with disabilities, depending on the technology they're using, how does attention to the needs of people with disabilities or thinking about those design issues help us get at what we already have recognized as the limitations of our current models for creating structured documents. It's almost that except to reverse it in the sense that how does our understanding that structured documents are no longer uh, exactly suitable to recognize the nuance of humanities materials? Okay. And we need to move beyond those and we're developing strategies for moving beyond those. Okay. How can we then use those strategies to enable structure, uh, uh, accessible. accessible design. So let me I'm rephrase that, design. just make sure, and this is helping me understand it. We're recognizing the ways in which the models we have for creating structured documents don't capture the nuance of humanity's content, correct? Yeah. And so trying to solve that problem, does that help us make this content usable and more accessible? Are, uh, are, are there techniques or strategies that, we're, that we can use to then, yeah, to, to in essence, uh, twist them into making things more accessible. In other words, is it, uh, what, so are you saying, is what, is what we know about how to make content accessible to people with disabilities, will that help us solve this problem of structured documents, the models we currently have don't capture the nuance? Sure. Sorry. No, no, it's, I mean, I think it can work both ways, right? I mean, like, so we have two common problems, and I think that you've touched on ways in which they can intersect, right? Um, and, and that because we're essentially encountering failures in, in both current strategies. Thank you. Right? And so I'm wondering if, if, you've been, if you've run into or, or seen projects that you think are dealing with this question of structured and unstructured data that, because it seems to me that unstructured data is where accessibility is really limited, right? Like, yeah. You can't look at a, a, a cluster, uh, a cloud, you know, a, a, a hairball a visualization and make that accessible very easily, right? You can't if, if yeah, not really, no. You, right. there, so there are lots of things that we do that in the digital humanities where we're presenting information that's based, we're thinking primarily that somebody's gonna look at this. We're not thinking, well, how is somebody who's gonna listen to this gonna understand it? Because we don't know how people who listen to information do stuff. Word clouds or you know other kinds of information visualization are a good example. Uh, some of the pushback that I've gotten, and it's been minimal, most people go, this is a great idea. But somebody pointed out, well, not everything needs to be accessible. Like, you know, an information visualization isn't, doesn't need to be made accessible to somebody who can't see. I'm like, yeah, you're missing the point. The point isn't visualization. The point is, here's a massive amount of information that you're trying to present to somebody through one sense. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's your eye or your ear. You're trying to make it understandable quickly through a sense. We're doing a lot of visualization because most of us who are doing those things can see. What would it be? What would information oralization sound like? I was going to say look like, but using that in the figurative sense. 
I'm not answering your question because I don't really, I'm not sure I grasp it, not because you're not explaining it well, but just because it's just not clicking. But here's something I'm thinking of. And I know you said we have one more. All right, one let more me, minute. Let me just say this quickly. TEI marked up text would be great for being converted into what's called textbook braille. Textbook Braille is more sophisticated, well, I shouldn't say more sophisticated, it's different, and it allows for different kinds of information, metadata information, than contracted Braille, which is the tool that we have built this year, um, in that it'll identify, like, this is a speaker. Romeo, that's a speaker. Here are stage directions. Okay, now we've ended this scene, we're moving to the next scene. Like, TEI does that. If somebody could build the translation tool that would take TEI text and turn it into textbook Braille, that would be huge. That's not getting at your question. This might get at your question. We used to have this philosophy of web design that fell under the category of, and this is Wikipedia, which as we all know is never wrong, that fell under the category of fault tolerant design, which was make sure your web page is gracefully degraded. You create this really fancy detailed web page, make sure that if somebody looks at it on another device that it degrades gracefully and it still works. We're now into an era of progressive enhancement. Start at the level of this should work on the simplest device, and then progressively enhance so that these other, but if, if I can't get it here, you've got a problem. That doesn't really answer the question. I want to talk to you about it more. And it, it, it actually, I think, nicely pinpoints the, the, what I was looking for. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason tells me that, he, that, that nicely pinpoint, pinpoints what he was looking for. I'm glad. I just kind of stumbled into that. What a great way to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now I get to go on Twitter and see what everybody said.